the only seascape that Rembrandt ever painted is entitled Storm on the Sea of Galilee. You'll find a picture of it on the back of the bulletin. It's the story of Jesus and the disciples out there in the boat in the midst of the storm where the disciples are frightened and Jesus is asleep. And as Russ Ramsey points out, Rembrandt is a storyteller. It is a dramatic scene where he captures all of these dangerous details. There is the wave that is crashed over the side of the boat, tilting it to one side so heavily that it is threatened to capsize it. And then down towards the right side of the boat, there is this disciple that is pulling against the oar as hard as he can, trying to control what is absolutely uncontrollable. And then several of them have reached up. They are grabbing onto the sail that has ripped down the center because the wind is so fierce. And down there towards the middle of the boat, one disciple is leaning over the edge, completely seasick, just hoping it will all be over. And there's still a little bit of light left in the top left-hand part of the painting. But it feels as if the darkness is about to take it over. The only calm face is Jesus, there towards the right side of the boat at the bottom, where several disciples are looking to him for help. It was not uncommon for artists to sign their paintings, but contrary to what we might assume, they might, we might think they'd just sign their initials down in the bottom right corner of the frame. But at the time, it was more common for an artist to put his or her face on one of the characters in the painting. And Rembrandt did just that that down there in the middle of the boat, there is one disciple whose clothing looks like a blue color, and he is reaching up, holding on to a rope, and he's looking directly out at us. That is Rembrandt. Looking out directly at you and me, almost recognizing the storms, that surround our lives as well. Acknowledging that we all depend on the grace of God to hold us close when the darkness feels like it is going to take over the light. The psalmist sounds like someone who has emerged from one of those storms. Only someone who knows the fear of those storms can say, my soul faints, my soul longs for the Lord. Only those who have felt that journey and that fear of the surrounding storms knows the meaning of true longing. That whenever we find ourselves at home with God, even in the middle of a storm, we know that a day in the courts of the Lord is better than a thousand elsewhere. That we would rather be a doorkeeper in God's house than anything else. That we long and we yearn for this. And this longing is itself a form of prayer. Interestingly enough, it says that even the sparrow finds a home with God. 
It might remind us of those words that Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew, recounting, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. That even the sparrow finds a home with God, which is remarkable and strange. Sarah, sparrows are sold for a penny. They are cheap and they are insignificant. They're one of the most common animals throughout the entire world, and yet not one of them is forgotten. And the sparrow in Scripture is akin to the house sparrow of today, which do not win many awards. You don't find the house sparrow on pages of books used by birders who are going out seeking different species to take pictures of. The sparrow is the bird that gives all the other birds a bad name. That They live wherever humans live, and they don't pay rent. They move into the rafters of barns. The bridges of cities, the eaves of roofs, the gutters of homes, they are pests. And there's all these efforts that have been made to deter them and to get rid of them. At one time, it was illegal to feed a sparrow in New York. There was even this Lutheran minister in Germany that lobbied the government for all sparrows to be exterminated because they had moved into the rafters of the sanctuary and they were distracting people during the sermon. But the psalmist and Jesus remind us as Debbie Blue writes, God cares for what the world considers insignificant. And the storms of life and the impending darkness can make us feel alone and insignificant. But the sparrow reminds us that none of us are ever forgotten. That it might be while we are caring for a loved one, that we have poured all that we have into the situation. We have done everything we know how to do. But there are some things that are outside of our control. We cannot make the hard decisions for them. We cannot change the diagnosis or make the treatment more effective. that we might feel useless and helpless, longing for the grace of God. Or it might be the hurdles that we face in life, that every time we jump over one of them, another one seems to appear, and we don't know what else to do. We're not sure we can keep jumping. We're not sure if we need to take a different route. We feel helpless and useless, longing for the grace of God, that we need the God that cares for the sparrow. The Apostle Paul was not on the ship in the middle of that storm with the disciples. But he faced his share of storms. He carried around the burden of regret, having persecuted others. He felt that rejection from people he used to call friends. He knew the darkness of a jail cell. He knew what it, lo- what it meant to long for the grace of God. And he invites us 
to put on the garments of the steadfast love of God, seeking refuge in truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation. And then at the end of this summary of advice, he invites us to prayer. To pray in the Spirit at all times. And this longing, that we have for God is itself a form of prayer. If we listen to it, if we express it, if we do not hide from it, because it can help us yield to the Spirit of God, letting go of other preoccupations, and create room in our lives to receive the grace of God. Because prayer guards our souls as it grows our souls, making us a little more aware of God's presence around us, helping us to notice things that usually go unnoticed and giving us this strength that as hard as we try, we can't quite put into words. One of the most iconic symbols that we think of when we think of the Wild West is the saguaro cactus. It's the giant cactus with just a few arms on it, growing out there in the extreme heat and little rainfall. That it can grow up to 50 feet tall and 10 feet wide. And after a single rainfall, it can store 1,500 gallons of water. It has a great deal to teach us about endurance and hope. But the cactus is also rather fragile, like we are. It produces countless seeds, unimaginable number of seeds, but only a few of them, or just one, will survive. It takes 10 years for the cactus to grow two inches and just a single freeze for a few hours can kill a cactus. That the best chance that a cactus has to grow is to grow in the shade of a nurse tree. A nurse tree is any shrub or any tree that provides shade. And we long for the grace of God because it provides us shade. That prayer guards our souls as it grows our souls because it helps us lean into the shade of God's presence. That even our longing for God is itself a form of prayer. And it reassures us that we are as important to God as even the sparrow. Amen.